Hello and welcome to this British Chamber of Commerce in Japan event from surviving to thriving, building a brighter future, something I'm sure everyone will agree is a very attractive prospect. I'm Tova Kinooka, um, Director of Global Perspectives and um, one of the XCOM members, Executive Committee members at the BCCJ. And I'm delighted to be here today with Dr. Wayne Visser, and I'll introduce him a little bit more in a moment. Um, before that, just a few small housekeeping points. So this is in, in webinar format today. Um, you'll see we have a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And uh, as we sort of move on through the uh, chat with Dr. Visser today, please do feel free to ask questions. Um, and you'll also be able to comment and upvote each other's questions as well. So we'd love to make this as interactive as possible. Um, we'll run for around 45 minutes. We'll aim for that, um, perhaps a little more, perhaps a little less. We'll see how it goes. And uh, we look very much, uh, well, very much look forward to having you with us and hearing your questions. So let me introduce now our, our guest for today, Dr. Wayne Visser. So he is, he, he describes himself as a pracademic, a fascinating mix of somebody who practices in sustainability, but is also um, an academic. He is a, uh, let me see, it is a rather long bio, so let me refer to my notes. We've got head tutor, fellow and lecturer at the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. He's also a professor of integrated value at Antwerp Management School. And it's interesting there that he holds the first chair in sustainable transformation. So quite an unusual position to hold, um, very valuable one, I am sure. So he's also an author of over 40 books and has a new book coming out very soon in February, I believe, um, called Thriving and the breakthrough movement to regenerate nature, society, and the economy. So we'll be touching on that today because the, the content is extremely relevant for everything that we're doing in the Responsible Business Task Force at the BCCJ, everything I'm, uh, you're doing in your businesses as well, I'm sure, and that we've been hearing about a lot recently in the light of COP26. So Dr. Visser, welcome to the um, event today. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. And I know you have um, a connection to Japan um, right back at the, the early stage of your career. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, in fact, uh, Japan was one of the things that really got me onto the sustainability path as a career. Uh, I got interested uh, in the lead up to the original Rio Earth Summit, which took place in 1992. And I was involved in a student organization of economics and commerce called ISEC. And we started organizing conferences about this theme of sustainable development, which was still quite new. And uh, we organized our first global conference uh, in Tokyo, in Japan, in 1990. And I was fortunate enough to represent South Africa there. And we were basically uh, informing ourselves, but also collecting the voices of the youth. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I sometimes uh, remind myself that I was once the next generation <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, giving input to that first global conference of uh, 1992, the Rio Earth Summit. Mm -hmm. And uh, my career's pretty much been along that track ever since. So I have fond memories. Uh, we, we visited Nagoya uh, for a study tour and also Kyoto and I'm dying to come back. So uh, <laughs> I, at least I'm there in spirit today. Wonderful. Well, we very much hope that, you know, as the, the situation allows, um, you'll be able to come back to Japan and we'll get to do some in-person events with you as well. But uh, for now, it's wonderful at least to be able to, to do this virtually and to hear about that connection as well. Um, and it's interesting, I think we all have to remind ourselves that we were once that, that next generation as well. Um, and I think that's something that has been highlighted a lot, um, particularly this time with COP. Um, I think if we think back, suddenly those of us, uh, you know, working in the sustainability field, 
COPs previously have been perhaps something the sustainability geeks might have followed, um, perhaps not so much um, people in other areas of work. But this time it's been hugely publicized. Um, we've seen it everywhere in the mainstream media. We've heard young people talking about it and, and commenting on it as well. So it feels as though it's been very different. What was your impression of that? Well, definitely uh, the meeting in Glasgow, um, I, I see as a, a kind of breakthrough and as a success. And I know that view isn't shared by everyone. And in fact, most uh, of the young people protesting, 100,000 in Glasgow and more in 100 cities around the world, uh, take a different view. Mm. But when I see the level of awareness that uh, the, uh, the meeting generated, uh, not only that, more than 100 heads of state there. And when I see the signals that it's giving to the market, which right. are absolutely crystal clear now, then I think we were very close to a tipping point uh, where we will see the whole world transform on a net zero pathway for carbon much more quickly actually than people think mm -hmm. and so many of the things that uh, not only young people but uh, all of us I think are frustrated about in terms of the perhaps uh, too much talk and not enough action or not enough ambition sometimes um, I think that uh, these uh, these will resolve themselves uh, in, in the very near term because you can't be certainly a business today and not see the writing on the wall. It's, it's very clear, not only that we need to get to net zero by 2050, but that the urgency is much higher and mm. that we need to get, we need to uh, halve our carbon uh, every decade between now and 2050. So by 2030, half again by 2040 and again by 2050. Mm. Not only that, but you know, if you really followed it in detail, there were uh, big announcements about alliances and about uh, a breakthrough agenda around innovation for the hard yeah. to decarbonize uh, sectors. Uh, and not least of all, $130 trillion of uh, finance sector money mm -hmm. that is being uh, lined up behind this transition. Uh, so I think if we understand how change happens mm -hmm. uh, in complex systems, which is that you get these positive reinforcing loops, right. feedback loops, uh, this has been a big part of accelerating that. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you talk about in your upcoming book is this um, concept of convergence and how you get a sort of uh, things happening in parallel that begin to sort of, as you say, in a work in a feedback loop to to push things forward much faster than we might ordinarily expect them to move. So, what are the the different areas of convergence that you see happening now in relation to climate change or sustainability more generally? Yes, well, there are um, often. Convergence is talked about in terms of technology and innovation, and, and even within that sphere, there is convergence happening. We, we see, uh, you know, the, uh, the convergence, for example, of uh, renewable energy, of the use of artificial intelligence, um, the breakthroughs in batteries, mm. all converging at the same time so that uh, renewables are, you know, more than 90 percent cheaper than 10 years ago. Uh, in fact, uh, in almost every country in the world, new renewable energy uh, is cheaper than fossil fuels. And, uh, you know, we see the electric car revolution uh, happening much quicker than people expect because of this convergence. Um, but there is a greater convergence that's happening, and that's between the technological breakthroughs that are happening and the social pressure that's coming, not mm -hmm. least from the young people, is very important. And that we also add our voice and our pressure to that so that the governments and the business feel that. Um, there is 
real leadership coming from business, especially uh, many big businesses, things like the uh, climate pledge led by Amazon, where right. uh, hundreds of companies now are committing to get to net zero 10 years early by 2040. Um, and there is, uh, I think, a real convergence on policy. You know, um, most countries in the world have made firm commitments now to net zero. Some are being very ambitious. You know, the European Union cut em is cutting emissions by 55%. Mm. By 2030, you get uh, countries now banning fossil fuel cars as early as 2025 in the case of Norway. Um, so... You know, I think it, it's this convergence of political together with the market shifting very rapidly um, together with the social pressure and then the technological breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, I think, certainly the work that I do here in Japan as well, working on the, the people side of sustainability, if you like, the, the mindset and behaviors. That, that's really key, isn't it? Having that shift, um, particularly in society, supported by the the technological breakthroughs, supported by policies. But that unless you've got that mindset shift as well, very often those things will, will fall flat or not be adhered to or adopted. That's true. Uh, we have to admit that uh, we're all part of a system that's breaking down. Right. Uh, and it's largely our consumerist culture that is causing the stress to the climate and more generally to the to the environmental systems. Uh, and that's because we we live a high quality, but also a high energy and a high consumption lifestyle uh, in the West, most most uh, uh, markedly and uh, and of course developing countries and emerging economies are following that same path and that simply doesn't add up on a on a finite planet it's it's mm -hmm. not possible and so of course we will hit the limits and things will start to break down as we're seeing so uh, we do need a shift in in the behavior of us as individuals as citizens as as customers to make different choices, to make choices about a lower impact lifestyle. Perhaps we make choices about what we eat, uh, moving to more plant-based, which can have a huge impact about the kinds of products we buy. Are they fair trade? Are they uh, uh, organic? Are they coming from increasingly re regenerative agriculture? And so on. We can make those choices. We can make mm -hmm. choices about the energy that we consume. Is it 100% renewable energy? Um, but one observation here is that we sometimes think, uh, like politicians think, that we have to get to a majority of people agreeing. Right. And that's not really how social systems change. I was fortunate enough to live through the transition in South Africa from an apartheid, a racist system, mm -hmm. to uh, democracy. That happened in 1994. But what we got was... 40 years of resistance and of exploitation and uh, uh, of uh, abuse of power. Mm -hmm. And then uh, change started to happen and we got the, these kind of positive reinforcing uh, uh, feedback loops. And then when the change happened, it happened extremely quickly. And it wasn't right. that a majority necessarily agreed. So uh, the, the science on this suggests that anything between 5 and 25% of a group, if they're aligned, can shift the behavior of the whole group, and mm -hmm. then you get the tipping point. And funnily enough, once you get the tipping point, the rest kind of fall in line. So yeah. if the new behavior is a behavior that's simply low carbon and, and more sustainable or is embracing the idea of thriving, uh, suddenly everybody will be doing that because nobody wants to be left behind. Nobody wants to feel excluded. We are social animals. Right. Yes. Okay. So that maybe answers, I think, I've just seen a question come up um, regarding the, the speed of acceleration. And, um, you know, with this shift, we're hearing companies, as you say, make more ambitious targets, um, countries upping the, the level of their targets as well. Um, and the, the attendee is asking, in your opinion, are they enough to get us there in time? Yeah, it's an important observation because in, in uh, our complex systems, both social and ecological, we do get these 
uh, negative tipping points as well. Right. Uh, so especially in the climate system, you know, there are uh, 12 to 16 of these uh, breakdown points. And the one is, you know, the permafrost uh, melting. So that frozen layer of soil in the north of, of the world, as that happens, methane gets emitted. And as methane gets emitted, of course, you get more warming. And so it's a self-reinforcing loop. The same with the Amazon drying out and becoming a, a source of carbon rather than a sink right, absorbing yeah. carbon. Uh, so these are of concern, and that's why the urgency is so high. Um, but I do think that the convergence we're seeing that I talked about um, is going to accelerate the positive changes much more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and so long as we don't see the climate uh, transition that we need as purely uh, one of technology or purely one of carbon, but we really, we recognize that climate and nature are intimately uh, linked. And we, we put some of our efforts uh, into regenerating nature, mm -hmm. then I think we can compensate for some of those negative trends and accelerate uh, sort of remediation so that uh, we avoid the worst of those uh, those tipping points. Mm -hmm. But we do need more action. It does need to accelerate. But the point is, it is accelerating. And right. uh, it's a little bit like my friend, uh, Stuart Hart, who's written a lot over the years in on sustainability, used to say to me that it's, it's like you've got this dirty old coal steam locomotive, uh, and it's been chugging along for... 200 years the industrial mm -hmm. revolution and now you've got this really clean electric uh, maybe it's even a maglev type train uh, and it's way way behind but it's going much much faster mm -hmm. and so it's a race we are in a race for our lives mm -hmm. but uh, the solutions are accelerating and the change of behavior is accelerating now very quickly yeah yeah okay so that that's actually very refreshing to hear a positive um perspective on it there because i think you know as you said at the beginning that we often hear a lot of of protests a lot of negativity around the the prospects for the future but um tell us more about um the concept of thriving so this is the title of your book and it's something you you talk a lot about in your posts on linkedin for example what does thriving mean um, to you in this business context or, or more broadly? And how is it different to the concept of just, say, sustainability? Yeah. Well, thriving, if we think about the concept itself, uh, it's, it's getting to a state of being super healthy, uh, to prosper, to flourish, uh, to constantly regenerate. And the, the thing about thriving is we want it at every level of life on earth. So we want it in nature, of course, we want it in society, in our communities, in our cities, and as individuals, we want to thrive. We want our families to thrive. So uh, the interesting thing about thriving it is it is the natural state of life. Uh, life is meant to thrive unless it gets diseased or it uh, ends up having some destructive force that inhibits that natural process. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately at the moment for the last uh, 50 years, at least we've been that natural force that right. is disrupting. Mm -hmm. right? We've been like the virus on the earth. Yeah. Um, and so, so we're not uh, th thriving at the moment, mm -hmm. but um, we, we can choose that option. And it is different to sustainability. Again, if you think of the word to sustain simply means to continue. So sustainability is a, is a mode of surviving. Mm -hmm. And it's not very inspiring, you know. Uh, do, do you just want to survive? Is that why we're here on earth? Or do you want to thrive? Do you want to flourish? And it's important because sustainability has for the last 30 years set the level of ambition for business and for governments at a very low threshold. And mm. so what we've been doing for the last 30 years 
is doing slightly less harm, but still right. doing harm. Uh, and, you know, really not, uh, not solving many of the most difficult challenges we face. Um, yes, people have come out of poverty. That's one of the uh, positive things we can say, but inequality has gone up all around the world. Gender, the gender pay gap will take more than 250 years to close if we carry on with the current trend. Um, and then you look at all of the environmental issues, uh, the ecological breakdown, the fact that we've lost two thirds of our uh, wildlife on this planet since 1970, something that took 3.8 billion years to build up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I could go on and on. So, you know, I think that um, it's important to shift the ambition of business and governments to something that's positive. What if our business could exist in a way that the world is better off for that business having existed? Mm -hmm. And that means that people are better off and nature is better off. And at the moment for most companies in the world, that is not the case. And they're not even aiming for that to be the case. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a net positive agenda. This is the way that uh, Paul Pullman uh, expresses it. It's a regeneration agenda. This is uh, the words of uh, Paul Hawkin, um, and I call it thriving. Yeah, wonderful. It's certainly a much more attractive um, goal, if you like, isn't it, than, than just surviving or being sustainable in the sort of most basic sense of the word. And I think that leads nicely into some of the questions that are coming up here. So um, we've got a couple of questions about really what, what this means for companies, what can they do, and at different scales. So um, one question is from Phil Robertson, who, like myself, works for a very small company. Um, and he's asking, what can SMEs, who probably have a small carbon footprint, do to make a tangible contribution to positive change? Yeah, great question. And I think we get uh, caught up in the scale question mm. uh, or challenge and partly we don't understand how change happens. So in a complex system where there are very tight relationships, a, a basic network, which is all living systems, mm. but increasingly our, our global society is networked in this way. Uh, you Firstly, you can't control that system. You can't actually change it nobody can because it's all it's all enmeshed and uh, all that we need to do is uh, make a change in our sphere of influence and then it ripples through the system and the little change that you make might cause somebody else to make a little change and that might reinforce somebody else making a little change and what happens is it accumulates through the system and it turns into these positive feedback loops. And that's where you get the butterfly effect that you've probably right. heard of. This mm -hmm. is linked to chaos theory, uh, where you know the uh, uh, flap, flap of a butterfly's wings in one part of the world can cause a typhoon on the other part. Um, and so what practically can uh, SMEs do? Well, it really is uh, looking at, of course, your, uh, your products that you're putting out into the world or the services that you're putting out, are they purpose-driven? Mm -hmm. So uh, are they aligned to a social or environmental mission? Same question, are you making the world a better place as a result of your business existing? Mm -hmm. And then just looking at, at uh, your own footprint, of course, we all consume carbon. We can all make choices about um, you know, the, uh, the energy that we, we consume, the way that we get around. So mobility is a big, uh, has a big footprint. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then we can make choices about the relationships we choose to have. Mm -hmm. So who are you supplying your services to? Um, you know, are you simply supporting an old guard uh, the dinosaurs that are going to die out, or are you working with those? Uh, one of the most powerful things we can do is to form a coalition of the willing. So right. yeah. really work with those that have good positive energy and that are also trying to bring solutions. And mm -hmm. then that has this amplification effect. Um, 
of course, you're always part of a supply chain. So really yeah. look at your suppliers mm -hmm. and look at your customers. Most of the impact for most companies, and it's true of SMEs as well, is in the, um, in the supply chain of what you're buying mm -hmm. uh, and in the customer use phase of your products or your services. So you need to play an influencer role just to the extent that you ca can. Mm -hmm. And a group like uh, BCCJ is a great example because when you are a small company, it makes a lot of sense to get into coalitions and to get into grouping together because together you have a bigger, a bigger voice, you can align behind a common purpose as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And very much what we're aiming to do, um, you know, at the BCCJ here. So it's good to, to hear that validated. Um, another question has come up again relating to what sort of companies are doing. So this is from Mari Ono, who I know works for a very large multinational tech company. Um, and she's concerned that Japanese companies in particular perhaps wait for other companies to go first. Nobody wants to be first to do this. Um, that's often seen as taking a, an, a huge risk. Um, will this, you know, moving to a, a different um, business model, for example, you know, the risks associated with that, if you don't know if it's going to succeed, are you going to lose market share? You know, it, we hear this argument again and again. Um, how can companies approach that kind of challenge, if you like, the, 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 the need to shift, but also the need to remain viable as businesses? Well, I think there, there is uh, an element of leadership here. So um, one of the things that the Japanese uh, society has been praised for over the years, I remember when I was doing my business degree in the late 80s, we studied Japanese business, you know, it was, and one of the reasons was it seemed to have a more long-term perspective. And right. of course, it was working a lot with government um, and strategically planning for these are the sectors that are going to be necessary. And, you know, of course, uh, automotive was one, but then uh, micro technology was, was another, electro electronics. And this was very, very successful. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, somewhere along the way, um, something has got lost uh, in, in the Japanese economy, in the Japanese society. Maybe it has become more risk averse. Um, and if you just look at the automotive sector, you know, I, I think that that's one example, right? Um, Toyota was, was uh, in fact, I visited the Toyota headquarters in Nagoya back right. uh, when I visited. And, um, and one of the things they showed us was this uh, innovation lab that they had, where they had all kinds of engines for cars of the future, uh, none of which ran on fossil fuels. And I was mm -hmm. amazed. And, I, and so I wasn't surprised when Toyota came out with a Prius, which was way ahead of the competition, uh, the hybrid but somehow they got stuck there. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so then they, they really didn't invest and they still are, are very slow on in investing in uh, full electric. And then you look at what's happened with, uh, with Tesla. Um, and, uh, you know, so in terms of, is this going to affect our market share, our competitiveness? Well, Tesla is now a trillion dollar company. It's one of only $6 trillion companies. Right. And it's the only one that has, uh, you know, sustainability at its heart. So I think the today it's it's the other question. I think it's if you don't uh, invest in a thriving future, if you're not part of solving these big uh, societal and environmental problems, you're probably going to lose market share. You're going to be less competitive. You're going to be the dinosaur yeah. that gets left stranded. You know, Unilever, when they set out on their sustainable living plan under Paul Pullman, you know, the shareholders were also very nervous. And, uh, you know, the, the company wasn't doing that well. And they thought we can't get distracted by these kind of big societal goals. Let's keep focused on shareholder value. But yeah. fortunately, uh, they ignored that. Uh, and, and they set these big goals to double in size while halving an environmental footprint, helping a billion people out of poverty, 
you know, certifying 100% of their agricultural products sustainable. As a result, you know, under Paul Palmer in those 10 years, their shareholder value grew enormously. The company really flourished and also became the place where everyone wanted to work. They get 2 million people a year wanting to work there. Right. You know, so I think it's understanding that we no longer live in a shareholder capitalism world. We live in a stakeholder capitalism world. Yeah. And we need to make that adjustment to say that this, th there are always risks in business, but mm -hmm. uh, this agenda represents now an opportunity agenda. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that Japan has always been, you know, known for its technology. And so many of the solutions we need today are technology solutions. Mm -hmm. And so it really should be positioning itself right at the forefront. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree with you there. And I think um, this answers one of the other questions that came up around, you know, how do we convince businesses to prioritize the importance of, or how do we convince them to want to thrive? And I think that that very clearly lays out the case there. Um, another part of the question, we've talked a lot about um, sort of, for example, carbon or looking at energy usage and so on. Um, you mentioned earlier nature and, you know, the, the huge losses we've suffered already in terms of species extinctions and biodiversity loss. Um, how for a lot of companies that we speak to, that's more difficult to understand, particularly if it's not directly related to their core business. Um, you know, obviously for, for something like Unilever, where they're directly, you know, sourcing raw materials from nature, it, it's an easier jump to make or an easier connection to make. For, for companies that don't have that direct connection, what would you say about, you know, how can they understand the connection to nature there um, and understand why it is still important to take action on that? Yeah. You're right. I mean, most companies really struggle with this. Um, and, uh, you know, I was just last week in Denmark uh, helping a company that is a kind of very engineering type company. Uh, they make uh, water pumps and things like this. And uh, this exact question came up. It's like, why should we invest in biodiversity? That's got nothing to do with our business. And... Um, so really, this is an exercise in education on, on systems thinking, mm. because there is no business that doesn't use resources. Right. And the way that we extract resources and we use energy today is just devastating the, the natural world. It is wiping out biodiversity at a, at a frightening rate. Mm -hmm. And why is that important? Uh, well, first, you know, you can just look at it from a climate point of view. We are uh, damaging nature's ability to regulate the climate. And nature, by and large, absorbs carbon. The oceans, for example, absorb two thirds of our carbon, uh, which makes it very interesting for Japan being an island. So uh, ocean based solutions to climate change should be a huge thing. And I know already Japan, uh, uh, like many parts of Asia, is involved in seaweed uh, farming and so on. I mean, these are, mm -hmm. these are huge solutions to climate change. But um, it's recognizing that whatever resources go into your, your business, they are having a huge impact on nature. And that's reducing our ability to, um, to regulate the climate or to keep us in a cl climate safe space. Mm -hmm. So anything we can do to restore nature is part of us, part of our business, yep. meeting its net zero targets. Remember net zero for any business is always scope one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. uh, and scope one and two, it's your internal footprint. Two is your electricity footprint, but three is your value chain, your supply chain, both your suppliers and your customers. So just by changing your impact on nature and hopefully investing a bit in restoring nature, mm -hmm. you can bring down your own carbon footprint. But then it's also recognizing that nature does so many other things for us for free. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it cleans the air, it pollinates our, our food sources. And when you start trying to 
replicate that artificially through technology or other things, it's extremely expensive. Um, so, uh, you know, last global assessment was that it's three times the global GDP if we had to just do 12 things that nature does for us for free. Um, so that's part of it. Um, the other part is just recognizing that, you know, people want to feel that your business is part of the solution mm -hmm. and they want to feel like you're having this net positive contribution. And therefore, if you want to attract and retain the best talent, which is one of the biggest ways you convince companies these days, especially the younger people, the Gen, Gen Z and the millennials, you know, at least have us have be able to show that you're giving back to nature, you're restoring nature, and you're not part of the problem. And that's mm -hmm. the biggest narrative we have to change. Today, business is still part of the problem and not part of the solution. And nature is the way that we, um, we become part of the solution. If we ignore this, no matter which sector you're in, business will be at risk business right. will become more expensive because resources will get more scarce and more expensive. Ecosystems will break down. And as they do, there will be disruptions of supply chains. All the risks go up for business if we don't look after and restore nature. Um, so I think there are a number of, there's a risk argument, there's an opportunity argument in terms mm -hmm. of climate as well. And there's a you know, a talent, uh, a, a feeling like you're working for a purpose-driven company argument. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, we could, you know, sum it up. There's a, a quote, I'm not sure where it came from, but somebody said uh, that there is no business on a dead planet. So I think that really drives home the point that whatever you're making, whatever service you're providing, you are having an impact and you know if the planet's not around to support human life then you you won't have that business there so yeah, i mean it reminds me again i get a lot of inspiration from japan you know and one of the things is uh, shinrin yoku uh, which is forest bathing this idea comes from japan mm -hmm. you know so it's also recognizing that people really like nature and we've we've got to a stage where we're living in cities and we've been deprived of nature but just give people half a chance and nature is extremely therapeutic it adds to our health and well-being so even things like uh, biophilia design so yes. designing your offices in a way that incorporates nature where you have plants inside you have green walls you have green roofs maybe you have some beehives on the roof um you know, this this yeah. is something that adds to people's uh, health and well-being, which is another crisis that we face in the world yeah. right now. People are yeah. suffering from, from burnout, from mental, uh, you know, breakdown uh, and stress, especially during COVID times. You know, give us a bit of nature and we're able to rejuvenate ourselves. So there's another good reason. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it... You've talked quite a bit about systems thinking. Um, we sometimes in our work refer to it as ecosystem thinking as well, just really helping people from, from individual level through to, to companies and to societies, really understanding those connections and that the interdependence of all of those connections and all of the, the players in the, the ecosystem um, is so important, isn't it, to, to get this shift happening and to, to help people understand what their role is and the need to take action. Yes, and I think, you know, we have to realize the different levels and parts of the system. So uh, the way I describe it is that we have six major breakdowns that have to turn into breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. um, there's the ecosystem breaking down uh, and resources being depleted. So that needs to turn into restoration and renewal. There's disparity in the system, inequality socially, uh, which needs to turn into responsibility, fairness, and inclusion. And then there's the health breakdown, which I've been talking about, which needs uh, to be reversed and become something like revitalization. And then there's the technology breakdown we haven't talked about, 
mm. the um, you know the unequal access to technology. Right. So uh, you know you live in a very connected society there, very high tech society, but not everyone in the world has access to technology. And with the fourth industrial revolution, that digital divide gets even wider. Mm. And so just taking care of that on the one hand, and also then the, the, the force of automation, which disconnects us again from the economy where a quarter of all jobs are at high risk of automation right now. Um, and then finally, there's the, the breakdown of, of crises. You know, there's the, um, the disruption that comes not only from pandemics, but from climate change and other crises, earthquakes and so on. How do we help people to get through that and to be resilient? So these are all the, the different um, uh, transitions we're needing to go through, and they're all connected. So what you want to do as business is be part of the solution, of course. Mm -hmm. But if you're providing a solution, let's say to um, resource depletion, let's say you're going to a circular economy, zero waste, closed loop on materials, mm -hmm. do that in a way that's also fair and inclusive, so right. that it's not only benefiting a few, but that it's it's uh, including many in that process and, and uh, tackling many of the inequalities. Or if you're coming with a health solution, then maybe link it to making people more resilient at the same time. Mm -hmm. Or if you're coming with a, a technology solution, make sure that it might have a positive impact on the ecosystem at the same time. So it's finding those synergies, which is yeah. really at the heart of systems thinking. And what I do in the book is I try to translate the science of system thinking into some very simple um, principles. Um, you know, the, and one of them we've talked about quite a lot is convergence already. That is a principle that we see that in, in nature as well. Things emerge because of this, uh, we get those uh, tipping points. Um, but there are others like coherence. You need a, a common goal that people right. can go towards. This could be the sustainable development goals. It could be something that you express yourself as a big positive goal. We do need the creativity. So innovation has a huge role to play. Um, uh, all systems also uh, need uh, continuity. So we need to be planning for the long term. McKinsey research shows that uh, companies analyzed over the last 15 years that have a, a long-term perspective do better in everything financial, in earnings, in capital, in employment, in, in returns. Uh, so long-term perspective for continuity is, uh, is really important as well. Uh, so we can take these principles and just apply them in our daily thinking and practice mm -hmm. in business. Right. So, I mean, sort of really taking it down to a granular level, every decision that we're making on a day-to-day -day bas uh, basis, at, either as individuals, but also in the work that we're doing, is, is just trading ourselves or, or sort of rewiring, if you like, to, to consider the broader impact and, and what potential opportunities and, and benefits there might be to doing things slightly differently. Yes, and I, and I think sometimes it, we can get lost in the details or we can get paralyzed because it's a very complex world. And so I think it's always about, you know, what is the purpose that you have as a business? We've now got over the idea that business exists to make money. That's like saying we exist to breathe. I mean, it's ridiculous. So, of course, we have to breathe. We have to make money as business, yeah. but that's not why we exist. So, for any business of any size to be very clear about what is the reason you exist from a societal point of view, what is what are you bringing that's positive to society, yeah. and then just to use that as a guiding star in in all of your decisions, mm -hmm. is this decision taking me closer or further away from that purpose, mm -hmm. and so the direction of travel again in in, in systems is much more important, because if you get that minority that's moving in the same direction and influencing each other you yeah. end up getting that transformation for the whole society brilliant thank you and i think that that sums up very nicely um everything that we've been discussing today i know we're just coming up on time now um any final comments you'd like to make before we we wrap it up yeah i mean i think i'd just like to end with uh, with the idea that 
this uh, movement for thriving, and I do think it's a movement now, mm. is really, um, it's an innovation agenda, which should be very exciting for business. And, and most of the book uh, is just giving examples of the amazing innovation that's coming from business yeah. and that uh, will uh, transform the world very rapidly now. So coming out of that um, is the message of hope and I think that's really important in today's world because we, we see so many of the challenges and we see, we do see systems breaking down um, and we read very negative news all the time. And so the hope comes from seeing the possibility for change, mm -hmm. understanding how systems can and do change very rapidly um, and also rooting that hope in action. So unless we're taking bold action, uh, then of course the system will break down. But we have that ability to take action in our own sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then seeing all the others that are taking action uh, and, and really wanting to move us towards thriving is a great source of hope. So inspired and hopeful people are much more effective in the world and it's a choice that you make whether to be uh, optimistic and hopeful uh, or not. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I have a poem called uh, Be an Optimist, where it starts by say, saying, uh, be an optimist, uh, you know, not because uh, the, the news is good, but because good people are working to change the world. And it's that sentiment, I think, that is the essence of thriving. Wonderful. Thank you. And I, I'd love to share, if it's OK with you, that poem with attendees afterwards in our, our follow up. Um, I think I've read it. It's a very, very powerful poem. And I think um, it serves as a, a, a nice reminder of the fact that, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. We can take action. We all have our spheres of influence. And uh, if we can go back to your words, form a coalition of the willing which I think there are plenty of us around, then um, we can actually make good things happen. In fact, there's a thriving poem as well, which you probably haven't heard. Um, and if you'll indulge me, well, maybe we can end with that. Please because do, that, that would be wonderful. That, that really uh, sums up the, uh, the idea and the essence of thriving. So let, let me end with this. Our life is so much more than a duty or a chore of merely getting by without a why or what for, the law of tooth and claw, the struggle to exist, to rally and resist against life's slow decay, the way of entropy, of living just to see another day, to stay, to endure and survive. No. Life is meant to thrive. In all nature, things grow from seed to tree. We know the cycle of living through giving, of reap and sow, the flow. Things come and go, the cycles of grooming from sprouting to blooming, of stretching for the light, the bright palette of hope, the diverse ways to cope, to cherish and flourish, bursting forth and alive, for nature means to thrive. Society lives too, a melting pot we brew from cultures and crises with spices for flavor and kindness to savor, ideas for conceiving and goals for achieving that stretch us and bind us, that find us together in all kinds of weather, wanting what's fair to care, longing to love and strive for society to thrive. The markets live and breathe in complex webs we weave. The synapses of trade have made the things we need, each deed a chance to lead. While tech is getting smart, yet still it needs a heart, a compass as a guide to tide us through the storm and find a better norm, a breakthrough to renew, an innovation drive. Yes, markets too can thrive. All life is meant to rise, to reach up to the skies, to move beyond the edge, to fledge with hopeful cries. Life tries until it flies. It shakes and spreads its wings and trills each note it sings. While given time and space, the race of life is run 
full powered by the sun on land in seas like bees sweet nectar from the hive all life is made to thrive that is fantastic thank you what a beautiful note to end on very powerful um and i love the the whole feeling of life is meant to thrive so thank you so much for joining us today dr visser it's been an absolute pleasure and um i've already seen comments coming in saying this has been really insightful really enjoyable so thank you so much for spending time with us today thank you very much great pleasure thank you bye